Jamaica, as a government entity, begged for its independence, whereas the Maroons waged war for 83 years. Are you crazy? Really? Do you know what you're asking? Welcome viewers and subscribers to another program. Thanks for stopping by. Remember before you leave, subscribe, click, like and share. There have been recent happenings with the Maroon community. On January 6th, they went ahead and do their annual celebration against the police's order not to have any gatherings. But however, their claim to being a sovereign nation gives them the laxity to do so, so hence they went ahead and do it. There are also issues with shooting and people end up dying in that community in recent times. The big melee now is that the gauntlet is seemingly thrown down to the government of Jamaica as to if they are a unitary state or not. So let's highlight a few things that the Prime Minister has to say and the supposed leader of the Maroon community, Mr. Richard Curry, and then we revisit the program that we did an extensive look at the Maroons and their origins. There are some threats that the average citizen looking on might think it is innocuous, it is popular and take a liking to it because the discussions that are held in places that should know better does not highlight the threat. Jamaica is a unitary sovereign state. There is no other sovereign authority in Jamaica other than the government of Jamaica. I want that to be absolutely clear. None. And under my leadership, not one inch of Jamaica will come under any other sovereign authority. What you are asking would be another for the government of Jamaica to fund, take taxpayers' money and grant funds to fund another government. This is not a government saying they are a local government a parish council government, which is under our constitution. Are you crazy? Really? Do you know what you're asking? This is the stuff of how guerrilla wars come and states break down. Wake up, Jamaica. Don't court foolishness and problems. Wake up. People have died as a result. And you expect me to stand here as Prime Minister and fund activities that could lead to the breakdown of our state? Never. This legal stance that Jamaica government is defending is actually keeping Jamaica from having a republic and keeping it as a responsible government under, under the monarch. The Jamaican government is a profession at begging the world the, we're selling out our natural resources, we're selling out our lands. These are regular day-to-day -day conversations that permeate the island as the government does not own its roads nor its airspace amongst many other things, which is why Maroons will not subject themselves to a municipality because Mr. Honus and his cronies will try to take our ancestral estate, the cockpit country, and sell it to the highest bidder. If the Jamaican citizens choose not to understand their true history, and stop blaming the Maroons as traitors, then the truth will be able to surface for the multitude to see. Today, in, a era, in this era of time, it is globally accepted that nations have a reciprocal, relation, reciprocal relationship as it deals with extradition. So when one reads the treaty, it's not hard to see that Jamaican citizens who were slaves at the time under the British Empire had a choice to join the Maroons under Kodja or his successors and be protected. Those who were fugitives from criminal activities or wanted to disobey the treaty agreement would be returned, similar to how extradition works today. This is Clause 6 of the treaty. There are two types of people on the island. Those who are willing to be righteous at all costs and defend their estate from theft and those who remain as house slaves and gatekeepers for the corruption of leaving the Maroons out in 1962. Each person on this island must decide who they are. Greetings. I'm Chief Richard Curry, 
duly elected leader of the indigenous Maroon people of the cockpit country. I'm a humble countryman, raised in rural Jamaica, among a unique set of tribal people residing in the hills of the cockpit country. My people bravely defended Jamaica against colonization and defended the right of Aboriginal people in Jamaica to govern ourselves and our own land in Jamaica land we love. I've never been a criminal or involved in any kind of violent activity nor organized crime. I'm not a gang member and there are no gangs in my territory. This land of my people is ours and ours alone. <laughs> No, 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 Please exit. Please exit. Please exit. Right, no, please exit. What we now want is our true game. Um, our true game at economics, our true game at commerce that existed prior to the treaty. I think the government have some serious decision to make. Grant them their sovereignty. I have no problem with them being a sovereign state. But with that comes some responsibility because the rest of the nation cannot fund your ways and means and living. The, our tax dollars cannot fix your road. You cannot get sick and come to our hospitals. You cannot call on our emergency services when in need because you are a sovereign nation and you are responsible for yourself. So the government need to now start looking at this sovereign nation and starting to require some documents, their own identification, their own passports, etc. Queen Nanny was an 18th century leader of the Jamaican Maroons. She led a community of formerly enslaved Africans called the Windward Maroons. In the early 18th century, under the leadership of Nanny, the Windward Maroons fought a guerrilla warfare over many years against the British authorities in the colony of Jamaica. Much of what is known about her comes from oral history, as little textual evidence exists. According to Maroon legend, Queen Nanny was born in what is today Ghana of the Ashanti people. During the years of warfare, the British suffered significant losses in their encounters with the Windward Maroons of Eastern Jamaica. Maroons attributed their success against the British to the successful use of supernatural powers by Nanny. But historians argue that the Maroon mastery of guerrilla warfare played a significant role in their success. Having failed to defeat them on the battlefield, the British sued for peace, signing a treaty with them on April 20, 1740. The treaty stopped the hostilities providing for state-sanctioned freedom for the Maroons and granted 500 acres of land to Nanny and her followers. In 1975, the government of Jamaica declared Nanny as their only female national hero, celebrating her success as a leader, military tactician, and strategist. Her image is also on the Jamaican $500 note. After being brought to Jamaica in the course of the transatlantic slave trade, many enslaved Africans fled the oppressive conditions of plantations and formed their own communities of free black people in Jamaica in the rugged hilly interior of the island. Up to the 1650s, under Spanish rule, enslaved Africans escaped and intermarried with the native islanders, the Taino or Arawak people, in their communities in the Blue Mountains. In 1655, following the invasion of Jamaica, the English captured Jamaica from the Spaniards, but many Spanish slaves became free under Spanish Maroon leaders such as Juan de Bolas and Juan de Saras. These formerly enslaved people, with their ranks, enhanced with the escaped and liberated slaves became the core of the Windward Maroons. They staged a prolonged fight against English subjugation and enslavement. Later in the 17th century, more slaves escaped joining the two main bands of Windwards and Leeward Maroons. By the early 18th century, these Maroon towns were headed respectively by Nanny, who shared the leadership of the Eastern Maroons with Kwao, and Captain Kojo and a compound in the West. In 1739 and 1740, these Maroons led most of the slave rebellions in Jamaica. Helping to free slaves from the plantations, they raided and then damaged lands and buildings held by the plantation owners. The Windward Maroon's success against a much superior and better armed enemy was a testament to the great skill their leader Nanny possessed. One of their advantages over the British was their long-range communications capability. They pioneered the use of a cow horn called an aben. 
In signing treaties with the Maroons, the British not only made a truce with a troublesome foe, but also enlisted that foe in capturing runaway slaves. The colonial authorities initially recognized two Maroon towns, Crawford's Towns and Codger's Town, later to be renamed Trelawney Town. Eventually, there were five Maroon towns in the 18th century, a compound town, Trelawney Town, Charlestown, Scotsall, and Nanny Town, later Moore Town. Living under their own chiefs with a British supervisor in each town, in exchange they agreed not to harbor new runaway slaves but to help catch them for bounties. During Taki's war, which the Maroons helped to suppress, the first official reference to Moreton in the colonial records was in 1760. I know I may lose some friends over my following statements, but you see once the truth is my friend, I don't give a kick who want to stay or who want to go. Truth is truth and we must not be biased against truth. We can have our biases because we are all human beings and we love to have our own ways and means and our own opinions and that's okay. But truth is truth. Now, I question the heroism of Nani of the Maroons and Kojo. Well, Kojo is not yet named a national hero, but there are calls for this man to be called a national hero. These people were runaway slaves and they fought valiantly against the British and the British could not win them over. So the British had to go and make a treaty with them and that's cool, we respect them for that. But the treaty they made with the British, and get this now, they were contracted to catch other runaway slaves and bring them back to the plantations. You see the people who talk about Shaka Zulu and this and that, Shaka Zulu was a murderer. Shaka Zulu killed more of his people than anything. Shaka Zulu wanted to control the entire African continent. And what he did was go around and kill tribes, kill people of other tribes that doesn't see to his ways and wills. And we are venerating such a person? Huh? Really? Hero status? Something must be wrong with me. But I have a serious problem with that. Nanny could never be a hero for me or a heroine because she's a traitor to the black race. So for the government to bestow upon her national hero status may have a serious problem with that. Of a person who ran away as a slave, found a community, fight back against the oppressors. No, the oppressors cannot defeat you, so they come to you with a treaty. And your treaty, the, the treaty with you is that you catch the other runaway slaves and bring them back. And me must venerate you, me must see you and respect you and call you a hero. I think not. I think not. The, it, it is so sad that people can't really put this into focus. Yes, we respect that she was brilliant and a mastermind in strategies and plans in repelling the, the Europeans. But for her to go and sign a treaty with the enemy to know capture your own black people who are trying to get the same thing that you did run away to be free and you are a hero i cannot consider you a hero not in this day and life they taught us in school that these are the seven hero or six hero and one heroine and yeah but you don't know the history and that's why some of these histories need to be taught more and more to the younger folks so they can have an opinion for themselves and not foist anything on everybody have an opinion that's fine but truth is truth. This woman was really not deserving of heroism status. No, not in my book. That's what I have to say. Leave your comments, subscribe, click like, share, or even dislike. Peace out until next week.